Thanks for watching Access Church Online. We invite you to stay connected and listen in. We hope that this word from our series, Victory, encourages your life. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for this uh, continued sessions in this series called Victory. Uh, this is part five, and we continue this today. So uh, thank you for being with us. In previous uh, Sundays, we have shared with you about uh, two doors. Uh, we shared about a door of temptation and how we may be prone and thinking we have to go through that door and, and all of that, but we also introduced to you a door of invitation that God is faithful and God uh, gives you a way out, and we went through that. And then my last session with you, we talked about a garden, how your mind is in fact a garden, and you are responsible to be that gardener. And we talked about taking out that which we would like to not be there, those things that are hindering us, and then replanting some new things. And I suggested to you that we replant with things like this, that I am in God's story. It's not just my story now, but it's God's story. It's much bigger, and that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. These made things have purpose. My life has purpose. That the cross has the final word of all things in your life, that we serve at the pleasure of the king. You know, we're surrendered to him. He's done everything for us, and so we are serving at his pleasure. I've planted in my mind that Jesus is Lord. I remember, in fact, uh, just about to the day of planting that in my mind, that was key for me as a new believer, and that's key for you as well. Jesus is Lord. My God turns evil into good. There are things that don't go the way that I thought they should, and there are things that I would rather not have experienced, and yet I'm confident that my God turns evil into good, and that God is good regardless of the outcome. The outcomes are not always as I would choose, but I am not God, and I am trusting in one who is sovereign, who is Lord, and so I trust those outcomes to him. He is good regardless of the outcome. I share with you today, though, uh, as this next step, and the Apostle Paul gives us in Romans 8 uh, what it is to live life in the Spirit. And I want to give some, uh, some time to that today and leave you with an application of uh, what Paul is telling us in Romans 8. So I, I encourage you to read all of Romans 8. Uh, it's, it's a short passage, and let that be a meditation point for you this week, but I'm going to pull for the sake of time uh, some verses beginning in verse 5 today of Romans 8 and read down through uh, verse 14. But in Romans 8 in verse 5, Paul writes, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And so he's laying out this, this could go one of two ways here, and that it's important where our minds are set, where our minds are set, you know, where, where we're, our thought life is going, what we're contemplating, what we're allowing to consume our thought life, where our minds are set. Verse 6, the mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. In verse 9, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, if you're a Christ follower, if the Spirit of God has come to reside in you, the Holy Spirit has been part of this process where you've said yes to Jesus, so Holy Spirit inside of you, then you're not controlled by the sinful nature. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, verse 10, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your 
mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Led by the Spirit. The Spirit led life. There's a lot of ifs in this passage. I go back and just mark uh, in, in my in my Bible before me, I've marked every time I see if in this passage. There are some conditions as uh, it is uh, what Paul's writing here is to those who are following Christ. Because if you are following him, if, then there's the Spirit of God within you to help us keep our mindset on that which is of Christ and of God. This idea of where our minds are set. I had and it's a story I was reminded of this week when I was growing up in Kentucky. We, uh, a big treat for us was to go to the uh, Dewey Lake. It was a, a state park that was not too far away, uh, about, about 15 miles seemed like in those days. And, and so we would load up and we would go to this park. And this was our favorite place to swim. We didn't have our own pool. This was a public pool. And there were parks in that area. And there was this incredible big park in the area called the Spillway. And it was where the dam, it let out some water for pressure. But in this uh, multi-acre complex, there was a baseball field. I loved to play baseball. And this was a a real legit field, you know, with uh, level and and trimmed grass and an infield and a fence and all that. So not like our sandlot at home, but so we would play baseball there. There were monkey bars and swings and all of this stuff and a hill that we could roll down. And so uh, I was one of six kids at home at that time. And, and so we loved to go there. So when uh, our parents would say, hey, let's go to Dewey Lake, you know, we were all in on that. And we knew that they w- we'd be grilling food and we would have hours to go out and and explore this large complex. My parents, though, especially my mother, she gave us one rule. It was one thing that we could not do, and that was we could not go to the actual spillway where the rushing, raging water at times would come through that spillway. And and she would explain, you know, there were reasons for that, because people had fallen. There wasn't a great fence there, and people had fallen into that, and the force of the water... Uh, it, th- they would drown. They could not get back out of it, and it would suck them in. And, you know, we were uh, smaller, younger. I, I was probably uh, 10, 11, maybe 12 years old uh, in, in this memory of mine. And, 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 and so that was the rule, one rule. Don't go near the raging water. And so with that, they would set up camp and choose our favorite picnic table and our, our grill, and we'd fire up the charcoal and us kids, we could go out and we could go to any place in the park, uh, play baseball, play with the swings, uh, just run and go. We'd play football. But, you know, my mind became set on, I've got to, hear, I've got to get near that water. Because there were times I could hear that water. It was, it was rushing and raging. And, it, and, and my mind just became set and focused upon, how can I get to that water and not get caught? Because uh, if I got caught by my mother, it was going to be bad news. Uh, it, she liked, and my grandmother liked, to use a willow switch, they called it. A, a willow. They, they would just literally cut or tear off this willow tree that was common in Kentucky. And they would cut a, a limb off that. It looked like n- nothing much. It wasn't very thick or anything. But when that hit your legs, especially when you're wearing shorts, uh, it, it was like a whip was ripping the flesh off your legs, and yet it left like no mark. There was no way I could go to the authorities and say, help me, I've been beaten, because there was no mark. But that that was their weapon of choice. And so this one day, this one occasion, I decided that I, I, I had to get near that water. I had to get there to the edge. I had to see it, and I had to experience what, because I could hear it. I could hear this water. And it seemed like no other, uh, none of the other siblings of mine were that interested in it, so they were doing their own thing. And so I began, as my mind again was said, 
I, I went off into the spillway area. And I managed to get there. I managed to look over the edge and I could see, in fact, that this rushing water, that what I'd been hearing and, you know, the mist from that. I can still remember it. And I, so I was just amazed and, and I was careful. I was looking over, you know, the edge and trying to keep my distance and not do anything too crazy. And I, I finally, I, I looked up though and, and I saw coming in a distance, my mother, and she was not pleased. <laughs> and uh, so I left that spillway area, went to her, and, and, um, and I, I caught some consequences that day. Very memorable. It was a rough day. And I, I, I never did that again. Uh, it was, it's kind of like that, too. You do something once, and the experience is so bad that, uh, yeah, you don't do that again. But my point with all that is that where my mind was set, uh, I allowed that to consume my thoughts. Uh, you know, it wasn't like a, a quick decision. I, I think in, in between seasons even, I laid in my bed probably at night and thought about that spillway, uh, that one thing that we could not do. Kind of like the garden, you know, we had shared about Adam and Eve. You know, one thing, they had this beautiful garden and still one thing, it just kind of consumes their mind. And, and, uh, and I, 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 I said a few weeks ago, we really don't know you know, you could read scripture and think, well, that happened, all happened in a matter of a few hours. But it really could be that that serpent planted a thought and just waited. And the mind set on, hey, I wonder what that fruit tastes like. I wonder if it's really as good as it looks. I wonder if God's holding out on me. I wonder if there's some experience I need to have here. And one thing, but where is our mind set? Where is our mind set? Well, the mindset in the flesh, it, uh, that, that's an easy one. In fact, uh, it, the mindset in the flesh, it's about that which is easy, that which is pleasing to, to me. Uh, the mindset in the flesh is all about me, what I want and what I desire and where I want to go. It's about my pleasure. It's about what I can control. It's about, could be about revenge. It's the mindset in the flesh. You did me wrong, I'm going to get you back. I am consumed with that, that my mind is set, and that's how the mind of the flesh plays out. The mind of the spirit, though, uh, quite different, quite con contrary to that. A mindset in the spirit, I, I would say this, that it leads to a, a healthy, functioning body of Christ that brings glory to God and will testify about Jesus. You know, if, if we all as a church, you know, we're not walking in the flesh, but we're walking in the spirit, then it's going to be healthy. It's not going to be dysfunctional. It's going to be functional. We're going to be how we interact with each other. We're not going to uh, say angry words. We're not going to uh, say things that aren't true. We're not going to be consumed with revenge. We're not going to uh, be consumed with our own pleasures. We're going to be thinking about an upside down kingdom where we serve other people. Uh, it is a healthy, functioning body of Christ, the church, this mindset on the Spirit. Well, what is the Holy Spirit? What is this part of the Trinity? We, we talk a lot about uh, Father and Son, and, and what is the element of the Spirit? Jesus told us in John 15 and verse 26 that when the Counselor comes, Counselor, uh, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father. The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Uh, th this counselor, this guide, it, it will bring glory to Christ, this counselor. It, it's also about power and acts Chapter 1 and verse 8, when the Holy Spirit comes and the New, uh, the New Testament church is, is birthed, that verse 8 tells us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, even San Cristobal and even Guatemala and other parts of uh, Central America and in fact the world. We will be we have power, and it's a power to be used to be a witness. We are witnesses of what we have seen and experienced. And, and so there's counsel and there's power. This work of the Holy Spirit, it's not an, an it, but it's personal. It's part of a, 
a, a, a trinity that we, we see throughout Scripture as these uh, Scripture supports that God exists, in fact, in, in three uh, persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is personal, it's powerful, and it enables us to be witnesses. The Holy Spirit uh, completes this trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was, in fact, a, uh, the Holy Spirit is an agent of creation. In Genesis 1, in the first two verses, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was with, without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And we see in John chapter 3 and verse 5 that Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. This conversation with Nicodemus. The Holy Spirit is an agent of creation, but the Holy Spirit is also an agent of God's new covenant through Christ. The Holy Spirit must be part of this uh, decision as we sense the Spirit of God leading us. We, 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 we sense the Spirit of God uh, saying, hey, come, follow me. Regardless of where you've come from or what you have done, come follow me. And so the Holy Spirit then becoming part of that decision uh, to follow Christ. There, there's a, an element of the Spirit of God present for the, the believer, the follower that says yes to Jesus. It's not some just head knowledge decision, only an intellectual decision. But it's the Spirit of God present and the Spirit of God taking up residence in each of us. Uh, the Holy Spirit is this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Holy Spirit authors the scriptures uh, through uh, ordinary men, uh, allowed them to, to write and, and their personality, their, their uniqueness is evident throughout scripture as we look at these people who wrote the scriptures that we hold in our hands today. But it was the Spirit of God that gave them uh, and instructed them and, and so that all of scripture is, is God-breathed and useful for these things. The Holy Spirit is also this, and uh, the Holy Spirit may be grieved. Ephesians 4.30 may be grieved. You know, it, it, you read that passage, it, it, it's evident uh, these things that we could do that are contrary to the Spirit. Uh, walking in bitterness and rage and the words and actions that we take. That's not the way of the Spirit. That's not what the Holy Spirit uh, would lead us to do. And so we can grieve the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it's possible that we quench the Spirit. We sense the Holy Spirit leading and, and being a part of uh, a gathering, and, and yet we can, we can do some things to just quench, and just like putting out a fire, we can dump water on what the Holy Spirit is is there to do and wants to do, and we can just, nope, we're not going to participate in that. We're, let's, just, let's just kill the atmosphere with that, and let's quench the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit can also be resisted. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, uh, talks about how, how that we may resist. You know, the Holy Spirit is leading in a certain way, and well, you know, we're not going to do that. Our mind is set on other things, and we're not going to submit to that, what the Holy Spirit wants to do. It's also the Holy Spirit is not for sale. Acts 8, 18 through 24. Uh, Simon, the sorcerer, he, he wants the Holy Spirit, wants to buy it. Peter says, you know, let, let your money perish with you. The Holy Spirit is not for sale. This is not for a show. This is not for uh, uh, some way to make some money here. Uh, that is not what the Holy Spirit, this is a gift from God that is beautiful and is not for sale to be profited from. The Holy Spirit also leads. Ephesians 6 and verse 19. Pray also for me, Paul says, that whenever I open my mouth, Words may be given to me so that I will fear, fearlessly make known 
the mystery of the gospel. You see, the Spirit-led life, it is, uh, it, there's some spontaneity to it. Uh, I can't overplan everything because I'm in the moment and I'm in the conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm just used to, I would, you know, when we used to walk through Kiowa, perhaps, or we used to walk places and, and visit stores and be out among public places, and we think we're there for that purpose. And yet the Holy Spirit just speaks to us and says, hey, wait a moment. You see the, the man over there on the bench. And the Holy Spirit leads us to go and ask how this person is doing. And the conversation leads a certain way. And the Holy Spirit instructs us in that moment. Uh, ask him if you can pray for them. What, what can I pray for you about, sir? I'm a, I'm a Christ follower. And so in that moment, again, it's just like that, that the Holy Spirit it allows us to testify and bring glory to Christ. It interrupts our day and interrupts our moments and, and leads us into uh, elements of spontaneity and, and surprise. And we see that throughout Scripture, the ability of the Holy Spirit to lead. And that, that, that's the, the context of Paul's request here. Pray for me that whenever I open my mouth, that the, it's the Spirit of God that may give me the words to speak and speak boldly and fearlessly. How often, even in my own life, I know that I've been intimidated or I've been, I've been fearful. I've been afraid to speak up. Maybe I look around the room and I'm intimidated by the people in the room. Perhaps I've quenched the Spirit of God, what the Holy Spirit would like to do. How often I've perhaps just been angry and I've said the wrong words and I've grieved the Holy Spirit because this moment could have played out so much better had I been walking in the Spirit and not the flesh. How often perhaps that I've just resisted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to do something, wants us to, to say a word or wants us to, I, I think I, I, when we used to gather heard last night we get together for 30 minutes. I hope that changes. But when we did gather, and the Holy Spirit instructs us, hey, I want you to lift up those holy hands. I want you to worship me in this place. Perhaps we were obedient, and perhaps we were not. Maybe we were not because we were worried about who was to our left or to our right, or maybe it wasn't the right moment. Thought we might disrupt things, and yet, have we quenched the Holy Spirit? Have we gone our own way? Paul telling us today, this life through the Spirit. As we, as we come to this part five of this victory series, as we've looked at you know, what, what our mind's dwelling upon, it just, just plays in so well together, I think, of, of where our mind is set. You think about the worst moments, perhaps, that you've had in your life. Those, those are moments you wish you could erase, those moments that are embarrassing you, those moments you would never want on the, on the big screen. You don't want it on the highlight reel of your life. But you've been present for those. What led you to those embarrassing moments, those moments of failure, of, of sin? Was your mind not set on satisfying the flesh? Paul says that doesn't have to be the way. This ties in so well together. It's this door we talked about a few weeks ago of temptation, yet a God giving us a way out. He's a faithful God. He, he invites us into go another way. Go deeper with me. Let's live a spirit-filled life. I've given you the, the spirit of God active and alive in you to guide your steps. You don't have to be the one that grieves and quenches and resists and and. It can be different. The Spirit of God can lead you. Living a Spirit-filled life, it, it's not a scenario where you just call as needed. Hey, if I need you, I'll, I'll call you. But I got this thing. I'm, I'm walking in, and we're going we're gonna to figure this thing out. We're going to have some fun, and we're going to live life. See, I'm a, that's what leads me to this point today of wanting to share this with you because I, I think this missing element of the Trinity could also be a missing element in the life of the church and in your personal life. That we somehow see the Holy Spirit as just an element of, you know, that we feel when we worship through song. You know, we, we uh, wow, that, 
That was uh, amazing. Or I felt the Spirit of God, didn't you? Or I felt the presence of God. And then we leave and leave that worship gathering. And, and then we ignore the Holy Spirit the rest of the week. And we quench and we resist and we grieve because we're going our own way. What if we could re-engage church? We re-engage the, the Holy Spirit as an element of the Trinity. It, it, it is God present. God present in me leading my life. That perhaps it's not as expressive, but it guides me in steps that bring glory to God and, and testify about the work of Jesus in my own life. Oh, a church like that, that's walking in tune with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, walking in that, not walking in our own flesh. It'll be a life, it'll be a life marked by surrender. We've touched on that in previous weeks, but this idea of thought life, this idea of where our mind is set, it, is, it, it leads us to a point of surrender. Holy Spirit, come fill me. Holy Spirit, lead me. Holy Spirit, guide my words, guide my conversation. Help me to live a life that glorifies you. You see, there's, there's fruit of the Spirit in this kind of life. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, talks about love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This fruit of the Holy Spirit, full in your life, evident in your life, leading your life. Your application I want to lead you with today is where your mind is set, surrender. Pray today that the Holy Spirit may lead your life and be where your mind is set. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for everyone who has listened today and may listen throughout the week or when convenient for them. But I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you are evident to all who may give a listening ear. That we may see people accept an invitation today to surrender. We've made a decision to follow Christ. The Holy Spirit has been a part of that, but we've kind of gone our own way. How often we walk in the flesh and it, it, it causes chaos in our lives. And we see this picture today and we dream about and think about, well, what could the, the Holy Spirit be a part of my life? Could I really produce that kind of fruit of this love and joy, kindness, patience? Could that really be for me? I pray today, God, as you find whole, uh, surrendered hearts today, surrendered hearts that would say, Holy Spirit, come fill me right where I am today. Fill me that I may be led by the Holy Spirit. That may be where my mind is set. God, give us continued discussion about this and in our gallery today and in small groups throughout the week as we take a fresh look at the Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God so I'm a child of God From my mother's womb chosen me love has called my name I've been born again to a family your blood 
flows through my vein and we sing I'm no longer I'm no longer Child of God. 